it would not be a complete worship service in the Seventh-day Adventist church if we did not at least appeal to God's word at least one time. Now, I know there's been other applications of Scripture and inclusion of prayer in other ways. Although we have had a beautiful and full day, amen? And there have been joys and there have also been consolation together. I would ask for your hearts and your minds for just a few moments longer. And I would also like to pray at this time. God in heaven, it has been such a great experience in your presence today. Such a time truly of expressing the joys of family. So Lord, as we do come to this point in the service, we do ask that your voice would once more be heard in this place and that your word would be uplifted. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I would turn your attention for a few moments this afternoon to the Gospel of John, the very first chapter. As I was considering and thinking about the sequence of events and the, the worship experience today, the Lord took me to this passage. John has the unique capability of no matter how many times you have read precious in certain sections, the Lord continues to inspire and to renew and teach in the words that we're about to read. I am going to keep it somewhat brief. <laughs> so in John chapter 1 and verse 9, I'm going to read a few verses with you this morning, this afternoon, forgive me, and then I'll share some thoughts on it. John chapter 1 and verse 9, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. No matter how many times I read, especially these opening comments by the Apostle John, it is amazing how each time I feel a renewed meaning and power. For the sake of time, I am going to be uh, abbreviating some of the lessons that could be garnered from this. John, in just these few opening verses of his gospel, is able to summarize the entire Old Testament. He is able to identify how the Son of God is the entire fulfillment of the plan of salvation and of the nation of Israel. And he's able to renew an understanding of what God's full purpose is for his people. In verse 9, again, coming back here to where we began in John 1 verse 9, John says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Now, he calls him the true light, not only to distinguish him from John the Baptist and say, now, John was a light. It's not that John was a false light, but John was a reflection only of who Jesus was. Jesus is the true light. It's also a callback to creation, as John has been talking about in the beginning. He talks about how light has come into the darkness, and the darkness did not understand. He's distinguishing that Jesus is 
the light that has come into the world. And he remarks this in a very particular way. From the time of the fall, when Adam and Eve first sinned, and introduced into the human capacity, introduced into the world, a confusion and a brokenness and a darkness, God has had to keep Himself at a distance from mankind. He expelled Adam and Eve from paradise, and from that point on, a wall of separation has existed between the Creator and His creation. Every experience of God in the Old Testament is always at a distance. The friend of God, Abraham, never got to see Him. Moses, who did so many great things for God and even appealed to God, let me see your glory. God said, I can't do that. You're going to see a part of it, but no man can see me and live. Elijah, that great prophet of God, the closest he could get was that still, small voice, always in vision, always at a distance, remote, mysterious. But in Jesus Christ, a renewed experience of God was enabled. The true light has come into the world in a way in which God was not able to accomplish before. Veiled still in flesh, but still He was the Son of God as much as He was the Son of Man. And it was the Son of God who became the Son of Man so that the sons and daughters of God, or excuse me, of man could become the sons and daughters of God. It says, He came into the world. He who was holy came into a world that was corrupt. He who was the brightest came into that place which was darkest. He who was the true light entered into our confusion. Verse 10, He was in the world. He was in the world that He Himself had made, the world which was made through Him. But the world did not know Him, and He knew that. He understood that. Going and Again, John is appealing all the way back to when Pharaoh said to Moses and to Aaron, Who is the Lord that I should obey Him? I don't know Him, nor will I let your people go. The world had turned their back on God. God knew that. The, the word here for world is the Greek word cosmos. That's into the created world. God knew. Now, He had hoped that the world would become like Nineveh and Jonah's day, that the world would turn from their wicked way, that they would clothe themselves in sackcloth and in ashes. And in John 3, 16, Jesus makes it clear, for God so loved the world. So He did not neglect the world, but nor did He expect the world to accept Him. Even in His ministry, Jesus said, I have come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it was not unexpected, it was not unanticipated when John says he came into the world, the very world that he created, but the world did not know him. And as sad as that realization is, as sad as that knowledge is, the next verse is even more. He came to his own. You see, out of the world, God had called a peculiar people. Out of the world, God had saved the children of Abraham. Out of the world, God had tried to establish a people, a kingdom, who would represent His principles. A race of people who would uphold His ideals. He called them His own. He said, Israel I have brought out of Egypt, and I have called them my son, and I desire to be their father. And it was to those people that He came. He came to His own, but those who were His own did not receive him. The world did not know him. His own did not receive him. It was into this experience that Jesus came. But as is the story of the gospel that is circular and repeats itself so often, God knew there would be a remnant. And this remnant would be unique. This remnant would be different. This remnant would not identify themselves either with the world, nor would they ultimately identify themselves with the people who had rejected God. In verse 12 it says, But as many as received Him, whether they be from the world or whether they be from the Jews, as many as did receive Him, out of that remnant who would choose to accept Him, the privilege and the power 
And the opportunity that God would bring into their life is expressed. But as many as received them, to them he gave the right. He gave them the right. Your King James Bible says the power. But it's the power of choice. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And then the latter explains the former, even to those who believe in his name. What does it mean to receive him? It means to believe in his name. What does it mean to believe his name? It means to receive him. His name, Jesus, he's my savior. His name, he's the I am. He's my creator. He's my redeemer. I have received him. I acknowledge him for who he claims to be in my life. You are the remnant. And more than that, he gave you the right He has given you the right to be called children of God. And I know you've heard it a million times, but here is the big deal. Here is the change. Here is the idea. You have the right to call him your father. If he's just your God, and he is your God, he he wants to be your God, but if that is the limit of your relationship with Him. If all He is, is that supreme being God, but you have not acknowledged Him as your Father, you are missing out on the depth of His relationship and love. He has given you the right to call Him Daddy. To as many as received Him, wherever you come from, whatever your background, if you have acknowledged and seen the power of God in your life and you have looked up and called Him your Lord, He says, you can also call me your Father. Now, there are two great principles that John in this section it wants to draw out. One is that great idea of adoption. He is happy and delighted to take a people or a person who has no spiritual father, who has no family, and say, you are part of my family. How many of you have been adopted? Are there any out there who have been adopted? Not a single adoptee out there today? Wow. How many of you have family that have been adopted? One of the stories in my my wife's family that she likes to tell is she has a half-brother, and that uh, her father, to whom he would have been a stepson, liked to say, there are no steps in this family except the ones outside the door. Which, is, which was dad's way of saying, to me, you're not a stepson. To me, you're my son. And the idea that God would adopt us is beautiful. The idea that God would invite us into his holy family, into a communion with him by which we can identify him not only as God and Lord, but also as our father is beautiful. But it goes even deeper than that. Yes, he has given us the right to become children of God, But even in the most ideal of adoption circumstances, there are often challenges. So God takes it one step further in verse 13. Even to those who believe in His name, verse 13, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but who have been born of God. You see, God does a miracle when we accept Him. Not only does He adopt us, but through the miracle of regeneration, we become born into His family. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't just join the family with all the baggage and with all the challenges of having a brokenness in our life, of not having uh, the privilege of being in a family to begin with. God says, not only do I adopt you, but I go above and beyond that. I recreate you as though you were my firstborn son or my daughter. I don't just take you. The whole idea of adoption is then absorbed and overwhelmed by this idea that not only do we join his family, but he renews us and regenerates us as though we and as we are born and recreated new in his family. We have not been born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but those who have received Jesus Christ are born of God. The king of the universe, 
the almighty, infinite, immortal God created everything for His mind and His will and for His joy and privilege. He looks down on fallen humanity and elevates us to the height of princes. He invites us into His sacred family, into His home, and said, that was always my desire. That was always my hope. If you will receive me, not only will I fill out those adoption papers, but we're going to go to the hospital and you're going to be born anew. And no matter how long it takes, we're going to be there when that time comes, when that child is born, because there are no stepchildren in God's house. There are no half siblings, there are no barriers. There's no separation of bloodlines. God looks at every single one of those who love Him and says, you're my child. As though you were born in my family and as through the miracle and process of the regeneration uh, through the Holy Spirit, you become, you become a child of God. I cannot think of a greater privilege that God would give us. I can't think of a more holy or noble purpose or experience that God would bring into our lives. But call us His son. Call us His daughter. And give us the right to call Him our Father. I think a father is a pretty awesome thing. And I know that God gave us the family structure so that we could appreciate the father that He wants to be. Never take for granted, friends. Never let one moment go by. Never let a day go by where you don't show your love and appreciation and thankfulness for God and thankfulness for the family that God has put us into. Let's pray. God, it has been a full and wonderful day. And Lord, I know many of us are going to leave from this place. Some have plans to travel or family gatherings that they're arranging for the holiday. Maybe others don't have plans at this point. But Lord, thank you for our family. Thank you for our physical family. Thank you for the spiritual family that we are part of. But Lord, thank you that you have given us. It's almost unimaginable. Just think about it. You're our Father. You're our God, our Savior, but you're our Father. And you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you that we can be part of that group who's accepted the power and reality of that light that has come into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. Bless us today, Lord. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.